Well, good evening, everyone. I'm always thankful for these opportunities that I have. I just got back. Well, I didn't just get back, but I was out at church camp all this week, singing week at West Virginia Christian Youth Camp, and we had three young ladies that put on Christ in baptism. And I got a message on Facebook last night that another young man uh, put Christ on in baptism. So we're very thankful for that and how great West Virginia uh, Christian Youth Camp is. And we had a few of our uh, youth out there as well. It's a great, great thing. Out at West Virginia Christian Youth Camp, the theme was family, and one of the parables that kept coming up was the parable of the prodigal son, which is in Luke chapter 15, which our reading just came from. In Luke chapter 15, we start to see this parable unfold of a father with two sons, and one son asks for his inheritance early, and he goes off, and he basically burns it all, and it's all wasted, and and the reading we had is when that son starts to turn back and realize he wants to come home. He wants to repent. And when he repents, his father comes out and meets him and and he has a celebration because his son has returned. And then there's another son that's not so happy necessarily that that the other son has returned. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the three individuals in this parable and try to learn a lesson about repentance from each one. The first character I'd like to focus on in this parable is the father. The father in this parable gives the inheritance to the son. The son takes it and burns it. And then when that son comes back, what does the father do but welcome him back? You know, that's a hard thing to do. And I started thinking about that. Isn't that a lesson for us about repentance is the father had an open door to repentance. That father was ready at any time for his son to turn back and to come home, to change his mind and to come back to his father, to come back to his house. He was ready at all times for repentance. Do you have an open door policy when it comes to repentance? Are you ready for people to repent, for people to change and people to come back, people to admit they're wrong, they've made mistakes, and come to you? And do you have an open door when that happens? Because it's so hard when individuals in our lives hurt us wrong us, make mistakes in respect to us? Are we willing to have an open door policy when it comes to repentance that if someone comes to us and they want forgiveness, they want to make things right, they realize that they've made mistakes, will we welcome them back? Will we have an open door policy when it comes to repentance? Certainly I think God does and certainly the father in the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, certainly that is what he shows us is this idea that repentance is welcome at any time. In fact, that's what our God is waiting for. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, if you turn over there, we, we read about Lord, our God, how He is concerned about repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. What does God want? He wants everyone to repent. He wants everyone to change. He wants everyone to come back. But do we handle it the same way? See, if we are going to keep our door open to repentance, what do we really, what quality do we have to have in and of ourselves? What quality do we need to have? Forgiveness. As I've went throughout my life, I've realized that forgiveness is one of the qualities in the Bible that sometimes is so difficult to forgive those that have wronged us. But certainly that's an idea that I get from the Father in this parable. Is he is ready for repentance. He has an open door policy when it comes to repentance. He's ready for his son to repent at any time. But in order to have that open door, you have to be willing to forgive. When I think of forgiveness, it's, it's certainly something that I think can be a challenge. But certainly, I always try to look to Jesus, the example and the forgiveness that he gave us, the example that he showed us throughout his life. See, God the Father is so consistent. He does not lie. It's a very important question. How does God handle repentance, and how does he handle forgiveness? Because Jesus Christ is certainly our example. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, For to this you recall, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. We should follow Jesus' steps when it comes to repentance, when it comes to forgiveness. Well, how did Jesus handle forgiveness? Well, we can see it through his actions. And one of the most impactful ways that I see Jesus modeling forgiveness is in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, what does Jesus say there? In Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, it says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. 
And they divided his garments and cast lots. Why they were dividing Jesus' garments and they were casting lots for his garments after they have done all of these things to Jesus, they have mocked him, they have beat him, they have whipped him, they put him on a cross. What does Jesus say? Forgive them. See, Jesus had an open door policy when it came to repentance. Those individuals that did all of those atrocities to him, made all those mistakes in respect to Jesus, beat him, whipped him, mocked him, did all those things. Jesus said, whenever they're ready to repent, I'm ready to forgive. Of course, I think his forgiveness was extended way before that. We see that in his mindset here. He says, forgive them now. Do we have that same policy to those that wrong us throughout our lives? Do we have that open door to repentance that we're willing that when people come back to us and say, we have made a mistake, we have wronged you, are we willing to forgive? Or do we walk through our lives with so many grudges? So many things that we keep a little checklist on. They did this, 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 and this to me. They did this, this, this to me, and I'm not going to forgive them. I am not going to allow them to repent. Forgiveness is certainly hard. When we look at Jesus, he certainly sets up an example that that for many of us, it, it, it seems like almost impossible. All these things that God has done, and yet all these things that were done to God, Jesus, and yet he's willing to forgive them. You know, the Bible instructs us in forgiveness, and it's very simple. The instructions when it comes to forgiveness is forgive others. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Certainly forgiveness is something that should be part of our lives, and as we look at the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, the father was willing to forgive, and because he was willing to forgive, he had an open door when it came to individuals repenting. It's a high, high standard in our lives to forgive those that are around us. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, it says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That is very sobering thoughts, very sobering words. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men's trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. When it comes to our lives, we should forgive. And by having that quality of forgiveness, by trying to forgive those that are around us, we have an open door to repentance. That people can turn and change at any time, they can come back. When I look at Luke chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, we see someone that didn't handle forgiveness quite right. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, we find the parable of the unforgiving servant. And we remember what happens in this situation. There's this servant that has a huge debt that he cannot pay. And he goes to the master and says, please forgive my debt. And the debt is forgiven. And then what does he do? He goes to one of his own servants after he's been forgiven, and he says, even though this is just a small amount that I I could forgive you of, I'm going to hold you to it, and I'm not going to forgive you of it after he had been forgiven of so much. Many times I look at our lives and I wonder about brothers and sisters in Christ. I wonder about myself. How can we be forgiven of so much but yet forgive so little? How can we be forgiven of all of our sins, and yet when people wrong us in in ways throughout our lives, we cannot offer forgiveness to those that are around us. When I look at the parable of the prodigal son, when I look at the father, certainly he was willing to forgive. In Luke chapter 17, verses 3 through 4, it says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Certainly when we look at this idea of forgiveness, is certainly something that we need if we're going to keep an open door to repentance. The second character I'd like to look at this evening is the prodigal son or the lost son. The lost son goes off and we see his attitude as he leaves and the things that happen. I'm going to start in verse 13 in chapter 15 in Luke. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 13, says, Now many days after that, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a, a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly had filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. But no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself and said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? 
and I will perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father's house, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The second lesson I'd like to take about repentance is about the son here. And the lesson I'd like to take is you have to be humble enough to repent. You have to be humble enough to repent. Now, humility is one of those hard words that if you ask someone to define it, they're going to have a tough time because humility includes so many things. But I think one of the big tests of humility is this, is are you able to admit that you're wrong? Are you able to admit you're wrong and that you don't have all the answers? I think that that is one core idea of humility. I think humility extends beyond that. Humility has many ideas tied into it. And certainly humility is a part of the Christian life. But what I'd like to tie into is that are you humble enough to repent? See, without the the prodigal son being humble, he would have never came home. He would have never came home. He would have stayed out there. He He would have done everything. If he could not have humbled himself, he would have never came home. Can you humble yourself enough to repent? Can you humble yourself enough to say that I was wrong? Can you humble yourself enough to say I don't have all the answers? And I think that's certainly important when it comes to repentance. Because without humility, I don't think repentance will ever happen. It seems like we live in a society where where people can't be wrong. When, When discussions are had, no one is willing to concede a point in an argument. Because conceding at any point in an argument would be a sign of weakness. You know, saying that you made a mistake or say that you're wrong or reasoned in a wrong way, you just can't do that. So we have in our society, it seems like everyone walks around like they're right and they've never made a mistake. Sometimes we see this in political arguments. It doesn't seem like anyone ever says, I just made a mistake. (laughs) You know, I said something wrong. I slipped up. I didn't say the right thing. I didn't do my research on that. No, it seems like both sides have the right answer. (laughs) No one will concede a point. Are you humble enough to repent? Are you humble enough to say that you made a mistake? Are you humble enough to say that I'm wrong? Certainly we have to humble ourselves in our relationship with God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6-7, through 7, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Our relationship with God is centered on the idea of us humbling ourselves and saying, God, I don't have all the answers. God, I'm wrong. God, I make mistakes, and I need you. Are you humble enough to repent? I think humility should certainly be a Christian trait. Let's look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. You know what makes the list? Humility. Can you admit you're wrong? Can you admit that you make mistakes? I think that is a Christian trait. I think that's a Christian idea. Can you admit that you're wrong? You know, in marriage, I got very good at that. (laughs) Admitting that you're wrong. (laughs) But can we do it? Or do we kind of beat around the bush? Can we go to our spouse? Or can we go in any area of our life? Can we go to our employer? Can we go to our friends? Can we go to our family? Can we go to our children and say, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Are we not humble enough to do that? You know, I played basketball growing up, and and I I grew up in this small town, and and I played with a great, great group of guys, and everyone in our community kept saying, you guys are going to win a state championship. You guys are going to win a state championship. You guys are so blessed. You guys are so good. You guys are going to win a state championship. Luckily, our coach didn't feel that way. Our coach said, you know, you guys are probably getting a little too much pride. He said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go play in Chicago. So we we all got in a vehicle. We went to Chicago, and uh, we got a little... Humility as we traveled over to Chicago, played against some of the best players in the country at that time. And, uh, you know, are we willing to say we're not the best? Are we willing to say we're wrong? Are we willing to say that we make mistakes? Are we willing to say that we need to grow? Or do we get lost and say, I'm not humble enough to repent? I'm not humble enough to repent. See, without humility, this son would have never came back. Because that son, in order to come back, he had to say, I'm wrong. I've made mistakes. Can you do that? I think the words are so powerful in this parable. Luke chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What powerful words to say, I was wrong. I have sinned against you. I have made a mistake. I teach uh, eighth grade science. 
And uh, I was thinking to myself, the start of this past school year, I said, I said, why don't I, you know, just admit to my students every time I make a mistake? Well, what I found was I was admitting to them a lot of made mistakes. But I remember one situation in particular where uh, this one student, he was kind of, he was kind of known as a student that gave teachers a hard time. But one time, I, I think I got on him a little bit too uh, rough, and I said some things that maybe I shouldn't. Not necessarily that they were, you know, outside of codes or laws or anything of that nature. I just thought that they were personally out of line. So I went to the student privately and said, "Hey, I made a mistake. I handled the situation in the wrong way." And I said, I, I hope you'll accept my apology. You should have saw the look on this kid's face. He couldn't believe I was coming to him saying this. From that day forward, our relationship changed. He came to me, and he said, well, you know what, Mr. Lancaster, a few weeks later, he said, I'm kind of sorry for the way I've acted in your class from time to time. It's amazing how far humility will go, how far humility will go in our lives if we just say, you know, we do make mistakes. Are we humble enough to say that we're wrong? Can we be like David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13? Certainly he got in a lot of trouble, but what did he do? He admitted that he committed wrong. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I've made a mistake. The second lesson that I see in the parable of the lost son is the humility. You have to be humble enough to repent. See, when I look at the Father, what I see is the Father had an open-door policy when it came to repentance. What I see from the Son, the lost Son, is that He was humble enough to repent. And what I'd like to look at for the last few minutes is the third Son. The third Son we pick up in verse 25 of the parable of the lost son, of the parable of the prodigal son. Verse 25, it says, Now the older son, now the father is welcomed him back. He's, he's having this feast for him. He's so glad that his son has returned. He's so glad that his son has repented. And th there's this other son in verse 25 in Luke chapter 15. It says, Now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house, and he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fattened calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your command, commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came who devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive and lost and is found. The third lesson that I'd like to look at this evening is can you have joy when repentance happens? Because that's what the father was kind of trying to point out to his older son. His older son was bringing up all these, these things. And he said, I, I've been with you this whole time. I've been with you through the good, the bad. I've been with you this whole time. He runs off, does all these bad things. Now he comes back and you're, you're, you're so joyous. And I like what he says in verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. Can you be glad when you see repentance? Can you be glad, can you be joyous when you see repentance in the people's lives that are around you? Because I think that's something that the Bible teaches us, is when repentance happens, there should be joy. It's unfortunate that many times that's not what happens. I think Jonah gives us an example of that. We remember the story of Jonah. We probably heard it when we were growing up in our, in our Bible classes. Jonah is, is sent to Nineveh, but Jonah doesn't want to go. Now, sometimes we don't, I don't think sometimes we get deep enough in that story. Why does Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Why does he not want to go? Well, when we study history, what we find is Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And what did Assyria do? Assyria came and attacked Israel and took all of Israel basically away to be slaves and all of those things. So when God asked him to go to Nineveh, he's asking him to go to these people that took his family away. These people that did all kinds of things, that sieged and attacked Israel, that did all these things. That's why Jonah probably doesn't want to go. These are people that he's not a huge fan of. And what does he do? He, he says, I don't want to go. And then, and then we have the big fish and, and all that situation. And then he goes and he preaches in Nineveh. And what happens? The people repent. And how does Jonah feel? He's not happy. He's not happy. Can we be joyous over repentance? 
Can we be happy when people decide to change their lives? Can we be happy when people come to us and they want to make things right? Can we be happy over repentance? Because that's the lesson I think we can get from the third son, which the father tries to point out. Can we be glad? He says, it was right that we show that we should make merry and be glad. Why? Because he was dead and now is alive. He's lost and now he's found. He says, it's right to have joy that your brother has changed his ways. Can we have joy in our lives? around repentance. In chapter 15, the same chapter we're in, we have the parable of the lost sheep. The parable of the lost sheep, the the, the shepherd has a hundred sheep and one is lost, and it goes through that. In verse 7 it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. It says there should be joy over the one that repents. And actually, the parable right after that is the parable of the lost coin. And when that parable completes, in verse 10 it says, Likewise, I see to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's this idea in the Bible, it's connected throughout, that when repentance happens, there should be joy. I remember a situation happened when I was a young preacher. Uh, some people came to me and they said, you know, something's happened. Uh, so-and-so has made a big mistake. And, and so-and-so I had a very close relationship with me. And they thought that this was going to impact my life majorly. And it was some major things that this individual got involved in, sinful things. And, and they called me and they said, so-and-so has been involved in this and so on and so forth. But you know what? All I was listening for was some key words, he repented. They said he came forward. That's what they told me. I mean, they were talking about all these sins that, that he ended up doing. But you know what I heard at the end of it? He came forward and he repented. I was happy. You know, they thought I was going to be distressed and I was going to be distraught because this person that has had a huge impact on my life, that's done many things in my life and, and has helped me and, and mentored me and done many things in my life, they thought that that would impact me in a negative way. But I know that we all are imperfect. And at all at one point, we all have to return and we all make mistakes. I was joyous when I heard that. All I wanted to hear that he, he repented. They were rattling off all these things that, that he had done. And all I wanted to hear was, did he repent? Did he repent? Did he repent? And when I heard that he repent, I had a joy. Because it didn't matter. Because he had repented. He had come home. He was lost and now he's found. He was dead but now alive. Can we have joy when repentance happens? So interesting, many times when we look out, when people do repent sometimes, the reception that they receive. Do they receive joy? Are we merry? Are we glad when they repent? Or do they receive something different from us? Do they receive the reception of this older brother that says, no, I don't want to be a part of this? What, you don't want to be a part of this this guy turning his life around? Yeah, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of this guy turning his life around. What are we doing? Can we be joyous over repentance? In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, it says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. How can we get mad at people following a command of God? How how can we be irritated, jealous, mad, when people are following a command of God, repent, turn back, turn away from sin? How can we get mad at that? Shouldn't be welcomed with joy. Certainly, these are all challenges in our lives. Certainly, these are all things that we can think about. But in relation to repentance, I I hope you you will ponder these thoughts on on these three individuals. Is number one, the father in relation to repentance. What did the father do in relation to repentance? He had an open-door policy when it came to repentance. As soon as his son came, he was ready to forgive, and he was ready to welcome his son home. Will we have an open door to repentance in our lives, to individuals in our lives? We see from the son that went away and burned his inheritance and comes back. Were you humble enough to repent? Are you humble enough to repent in your life? Because if you're not humble enough to repent, it's going to be very hard to live the Christian life. Are you humble enough to repent by admitting you're wrong? That's what that son did. He came home and he said, I was wrong. I made a mistake. I want to make it right. And from the third son, I think there's a lesson that can be learned there about repentance. And the lesson that I think we can learn there is that can we be joyous over repentance? Just like the father tried to get through to his son in verse 32. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. What words of wisdom that there should be joy when it comes to repentance. Perhaps this evening you need to repent. Maybe you need to repent of something publicly. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. 
Perhaps you know that it's time to change your mind and become a Christian. We certainly wish that we could help you this evening. I love the parable of the prodigal son. But it could probably be titled a lot of different things. It could be titled the prod- uh, it could be titled the the parable of the loving father. It could be called the parable of the lost son. It could be called the parable of the brother that didn't have joy over repentance. It could have so many names or so many lessons packed within. But perhaps it's your time to come back, come back to God. Perhaps it's time for you to go to God for the first time. If you need to become a New Testament Christian, the Bible is very clear on what we need to do. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no other way faith can be obtained. Faith comes by hearing. We have to believe, Luke chapter, I mean, John chapter 8, verse 24. We have to repent, Luke chapter 13, verse 3. We have to confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 10. We have to be baptized. And it doesn't end there. We have to live the life as best we can. If you need to repent, if you need to become a New Testament Christian, we ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.